this study addresses the cumulative risk of adverse childhood experiences across development using data from the core data set of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. Exposure to an event that has the potential to be traumatic can happen very young. Prevalence studies indicate that about one in five children under the age of five have been exposed to potential trauma. By the time children reach adolescence, a majority have been exposed to something potentially traumatic in their lifetimes. And as an adult, you are the rare individual who has not experienced one or more potentially traumatic events in your life. As has been said many times, however, most individuals exposed to potential trauma recover naturally and do not go on to develop clinically significant trauma-related psychopathology. In epidemiological studies of adults in the general population, we see that about 10 to 20 percent of men and women develop post-traumatic stress disorder with dispro disproportionately higher risk in women than men. In prevalence studies of children and adolescents, we again see that on average, youth exposed to trauma do not go on to develop PTSD. However, when we look at the range of rates differentiated by demographic and psychosocial factors, it is quite wide. For example, the range of prevalence rates of PTSD by a variety of factors goes from about 6 to 39 percent in the National Comorbidity Adolescent Supplement. The average rate of trauma-related psychopathology in individuals exposed to potential trauma in the general population does not apply to those who are multiply traumatized or polyvictimized, who have essentially grown up with adversity and trauma and who have experienced a number of different types of adversity in a variety of contexts. Consider the case of Latasha, who was first removed from her home as an infant due to physical and emotional neglect, then suffered repeated physical abuse as a toddler in a variety of homes. She witnessed ongoing domestic violence between her mother and her stepfather. Her biological father was imprisoned for murder. She was also subject to ongoing alcohol and substance abuse and lost her brother in a gang brawl. As a young adolescent, Latasha was sexually assaulted by a family acquaintance and felt betrayed by her mother who was not able to be there for her. And as an older adolescent, Latasha was again sexually assaulted at school and then bullied about it. She also witnessed multiple shootings in her neighborhood. When we look at her clinical presentation, Latasha meets diagnostic criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder. She frequently uses marijuana. She is on probation for aggregated assault and is failing out of school. Um, Latasha also has made two very serious suicide attempts and she engages in sexual risk-taking behavior. One of the first studies that brought attention to the cumulative risk of exposure to multiple types of childhood adversity was the Adverse Childhood Experiences, or ACEs study. Ten questions including maltreatment, having an impaired caregiver, and experienced emotional and physical neglect were asked of 17,000 middle-class individuals. In addition to finding that a majority of indi individuals said yes to at least one of these questions, their main finding was a dose-response relationship between the number of yes responses and a host of both physical and psychological health problems. Most striking was their finding that accounting for depression, alcoholism, and drug abuse, those who said yes to seven or more of the questions were 17 times more likely to attempt suicide. Finkelhor and colleagues found a dose-response relationship in the, in the number of types of victimization endorsed by adolescents in a nationally representative survey and found that about 10% of the sample reported more than 12 types of victimization. These poly victims were exponentially at greater risk for a host of serious psychological problems and functional impairment. They also found that poly victims were four times more likely to be re-victimized in the subsequent year. We used empirical clustering techniques uh, or latent class analysis to identify subgroups of youth with unique patterns of exposure in a sample of adolescents entering the Connecticut juvenile justice system. Here, we found a polyvictimized subgroup that made up a, mi a minority of the sample, but were at increased risk for PTSD, alcohol and drug abuse, suicidal behavior, depression, and anxiety. And in a different study, uh, colleagues and I used latent class analysis again in a sample of children and adolescents entering the Navy's version of Child Protective Services. Again, we found a polyvictimized subgroup which had greater impairment and showed increased risk of developing PTSD and or depression over the course of a year.
poly victims also had fewer social and personal resources compared to youth in the other subgroups. In the data I will present soon, we'll start to address the question of whether the timing of adverse and potentially traumatic experiences in childhood matter when estimating risk. If we look at Latasha's trauma history on this slide, we see adversity occurring across various pivotal developmental periods. If we could also map the emergence of her clinical problems, we can start to imagine how these experiences combined to influence her development and give rise to uh, these various social and emotional problems. If we think about the developmental competencies that occur across development, we see a number of areas where adversity and trauma exposure during sensitive periods can interrupt these processes. Given that meeting developmental demands in middle childhood and adolescence depends on the successful achievement of competencies earlier in development, it is not surprising that early childhood adversity and trauma is associated with impaired adolescent and adult functioning. To examine this further, we turn to the National Child Traumatic Stress Network's core data set. The core data set was initiated in 2004 and includes data from 56 centers that include community health clinics, child welfare settings, juvenile justice programs, hospitals, schools, and residential treatment centers. All youth were referred for trauma-specific services and were assessed on a variety of measures by clinicians. The total core data set includes 14,088 children and adolescents. We focused on a subsample of 3,485 adolescents ages 13 to 18. We took advantage of data we had on when various traumas and adversities occurred, which represented data from multiple informants and sources. 18% of the sample had to be excluded, however, from the analyses because of incomplete information on when the exposures occurred. The sample was racially and ethnically diverse and was slightly more female than male, and a little over half re resided with birth parents as adolescents, and almost a fifth were juvenile justice involved. We aim to identify and describe patterns of adversities within three developmental epochs, early childhood from 0 to 5 years old, middle childhood from 6 to 12 years old, and adolescence from 13 to 18 years old. We applied latent class analysis on trauma data for each epoch, so we completed three latent class analyses. Once subgroups were identified, we examined the demographic composition of the subgroups and examined whether a polyvictimized subgroup could be identified in each epoch. Finally, we examined the risk for adolescent psychopathology and juvenile justice involvement among identified subgroups in each epoch and determined if this risk was comparable across epochs. Here is a breakdown of the types of adversities and potentially traumatic events documented in this sample across all three epochs. And here is output from the latent class analysis on the first epoch. A three-class model best fit the data. The majority of the sample fell into what we characterized as a varied exposure subgroup, which had relatively lower le levels of exposure, but more varied across the different types. About 17% of the sample fell into a domestic violence subgroup, where probability of domestic violence exposure was 100%, with some smattering of other types of adversities. About 22% of the sample were classified as highly exposed or polyvictimized. The types of adversities that made up this subgroup, not surprisingly, were adversities happening within the home, including caregiver impairment. In the second epoch, patterns became more complicated. A five-class model best fit the data. We again find a, var a varied exposure and high exposure or polyvictimized subgroup. A sexual trauma subgroup made up mostly of girls comprised 34% of the sample. We also identified a subgroup with 100% probability of traumatic loss during this epoch and a subgroup with mostly intrafamilial types of adversity. Finally, in the adolescent epoch, we again find a five-class solution with some of the same types of patterns emerging. A high exposure group, which comprised only 7% of the sample this time, a varied exposure and traumatic loss subgroup, a subgroup high in community violence and loss, and an emotionally abused subgroup. Across all epochs, there were some demographic differences among the subgroups. 
While no sex differences were detected in the early childhood ep epoch, females were at least two times more likely to be in the polyvictimized and sexual trauma subgroups in the middle childhood and adolescent epochs. For all epochs, polyvictimized youth were more likely to be living in out-of-home care as adolescents. We found subgroup differences in each epoch having to do with post-traumatic stress, internalizing and externalizing behavior problems, and recent juvenile justice involvement. In the first epoch, polyvictims were more likely to fall in the clinical range for PTSD and internalizing behavior problems in adolescence. Polyvictims were also more likely to be ju ju juvenile justice involved. We also see that the varied exposure subgroup had a higher likelihood of having clinically significant PTSD and internalizing behavior problem scores. For Epoch 2, we find similar patterns, with the polyvictimized subgroup having a greater likelihood of clinically significant PTSD, internalizing and externalizing behavior problem scores, as well as recent juvenile justice involvement. Interestingly, the sexual trauma subgroup was just as likely as a polyvictimized subgroup relative to the others as having clinically significant PTSD. Finally, in the adolescent epoch, polyvictims were more likely to be in the clinical range on these measures and more likely to be juvenile justice involved. The varied exposure group was at higher risk than the remaining subgroups on externalizing behavior problems and juvenile justice involvement. Interestingly, the subgroup with high exposure to community violence and traumatic loss was relatively at greater risk for PTSD than the remaining subgroups. In summary, we find distinct patterns of adversity and polyvictimization across three developmental epochs. Types of adversities and traumas become more nuanced in middle childhood and adolescence, with more types characterized by exposure that happen outside of the home. A high exposure or polyvictimized subgroup was evident in all epochs. However, the types of adversities that comprise the subgroup varied by epoch, with early and middle childhood characterized mostly by intrafamilial adversity and adolescent polyvictims characterized by physical assault, community violence, and emotional abuse primarily. We also found that subgroups defined empirically by different patterns of adversities at different developmental epochs were differentially associated with sex, psychopathology, and justice involvement in adolescence. Thinking about clinical implications, these data highlight the potential benefit of screening for polyvictimization in order to identify and target youth most at risk of psychopathology and functional impairment. Understanding these developmental patterns and cumulative risk may also inform interventions aimed at preventing revictimization and reducing the impact of exposure. New or modified interventions might consider ways to compensate for cumulative damage and or the loss of resources that result from cumulative exposure to trauma. This is particularly important given that we know that traditional interventions for treating PTSD are less effective with individuals with complex trauma histories and presentations. The caveat is the lack of clinical guidelines for how to, to define polyvictimization and how information about multiple adversities is incorporated in assessing risk. Results from existing measures only provide a proxy for the extent of adversity experienced by youth. Simply counting the number of types of exposures does not take into account other characteristics, including the relative impact of, of the frequency, severity, or duration, nor the developmental timing of adversity. Our next steps are to test models that look simultaneously at multiple risk factors, including polyvictimization, as well as other resiliency and vulnerability factors.